Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Safir Jenkins, president of the Frontiers International Plainfield Area Club, and I'm pleased to present on behalf of the entire club and the organization and all of its members, today's lecture, an installment in the Westry Horn Cultural and Heritage Lecture Series, where we are going to be covering the topic on today of Frederick Douglass and his place in history. There are some interesting lessons to be learned, some that should empower us to take action where we are, and others that should motivate us to never again settle for anything that is beneath that which is what we are due. As an individual in your community, I encourage you, please share this broadcast with those that you love and know, those with whom that you wish to seek empowered and engaged to produce change in a world that oftentimes is reluctant to change. Today, I have the special privilege of introducing a lecturer who, for many, needs no introduction. And the lecturer on today is Professor James Small. Uh, before we jump into the depths of today's lecture, give me a moment, if you would, and indulge me on some details about our organization, the Frontiers International Plainfield Area Club. The Frontiers International Plainfield Area Club is now in its 62nd year of service. As astounding as that might sound, each year through our scholarship and educational programs, we help provide opportunities to local young people who wish to further their educational attainment beyond high school. We also host free seminars and workshops, both in person and online, similar to this one, to help educate and empower our community members in key areas, including the unspoken truths of Black history, financial literacy, and health and wellness. To enhance the lives of the most vulnerable among us, we also provide key mentorship programs for young men throughout the region. Our work uh, consists of partnering with community members to fight for social and economic justice and equal human rights. Lastly, we provide scholarships to help local deserving high schoolers pursue a college degree or professional certification. It is with that in mind that I declare that we are the Frontiers International Plainfield Area Club and we stand for advancement through service. If you would like to participate or join us in these efforts, you can donate your time, your resources, or your money by recognizing one, that we are a 501c3 organization and any qualified donations that you make are tax deductible. To donate to our scholarship fund, you can do so using Zelle at the phone number, area code 732-470-4207. You may mail a check or money order to our P.O. Box, P.O. Box 428, Plainfield, New Jersey, 07061. This information will continue to be shared throughout today's broadcast in case you missed that opportunity in these few short moments. But without any further ado, it gives me great privilege, joy, and honor to introduce to you scholar activist, dynamic speaker, and organizational uh, consultant, Professor James Small. He is the CEO of Sanaa Lodge Enterprises, Ghana Limited, CEO and president of the African American Management Company, Ghana Limited, International Vice President, Organization of Afro American Unity, Priest of Oya, Babalorisha, Ifa Tradition and past president of the Eastern Region of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. Professor Small has been an activist since his teenage years. His in-depth knowledge, thought-provoking and calm delivery are influential elements to break the programming of miseducation that is so prevalent in today's society. He studies extensively with Dr. John Henrik Clark, Dr. Yosef A. A. Ben Yochanan, 
Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who we've also hosted in our lectures, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, Dr. Asa Hillard, Dr. Wade Nobles, and many others, but these are to name a few. Professor, Professor James Small has traveled extensively lecturing at churches, conventions, seminars, workshops, colleges, and universities throughout the United States, the Caribbean, and Africa and Europe. His informative, eye-opening, and dynamic presentations have caused him to be recognized as one of the most distinguished activist scholars of our time. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming to today's broadcast, Professor James Small. Professor Small. Julie, how are you, my brother Jenkins? Mr. I'm President. Well, well, sir, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, and I'm honored that the Frontiers have asked me to speak about this extraordinary leader, uh, Frederick Douglass, who I, I taught about him, but I didn't realize how much more there was to learn about this extraordinary black man. Indeed. Um, in his day, he was a combination of a Malcolm X, Dr. King combined. Mm -hmm. Just the, the most extraordinary person, and we'll talk about him today and let people ask questions. There's so much, I was trying to figure out, what do you talk about? The man did everything in his time and in that space that God gave him. And he took some of the issues that we're dealing with today. Um, like one, when they came up with the, uh, there was a lot of free blacks. Most people don't know when the Civil War ended, there was over 300,000 free black people in America who had bought their way out of slavery, escaped from slavery, or had never been in slavery. And that population elements of the northern white population wanted to remove them from the country because they were competition. And so they set up the colonization society, which eventually established Liberia and 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 was it followed on the establishment of Sierra Leone. Most people don't realize that both Liberia and Sierra Leone was predominantly established by African Americans. Um, but Douglas was against that process. He felt, listen, we built this country. This is our country. We were here before most of the other Europeans came to this country. So we're not going anywhere. And, and, and I remember he got into a, a, a heavy fight with Garrison over how to view the Constitution. Uh, Lloyd Garrison, who was the top abolitionist of that day, felt that the Constitution was anti-African and pro-slavery. And initially Douglas went along with that. And after he learned and studied, he said, no, 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 no. If the constitution is followed to the letter, it is anti-slavery and pro-freedom. And so he began to advocate before Thurgood Marshall, how to use the constitution as an instrument of freedom. That's extraordinary for that day and time. You know, that was just an, an introduction on Frederick Douglass. There's a man who, who was born in what? The midst of slavery, you know? He, he's born at a time when one couldn't even imagine 1817 or someone being able to do these kinds of things, to learn how to read. And he was helped by one of the wives of one of his uh, slaveholders for a while, and then her husband convinced her to stop. But on his own, he would study from other young white kids who he knew and played with. He would study from just reading anything that he saw that had writing on it. And he taught himself to become this extraordinary, not just orator, but an extraordinary writer. So much so that when he wrote his autobiography, there were those that said that he couldn't have written this. There's no way a black man could have written a book this scholarly, okay? And at the time that he wrote the autobiography, I think it was about 23, 24 years old, it was the top book in the country. It was rated that highly. So, 
and it, and it, and it, and it, and just his presence as an orator and a writer flew in the face of all the criticism that Africans could not be competitive in the intellectual America, that we could not be a part of that flow that developed this new concept and idea of democracy and freedom. And Douglas flew in the face of all of that, which made him the most extraordinary man. And to think that he would live to age 77, someone who was born in slavery, whose mother was taken away from him as a baby, and who was raised by his maternal grandmother and grandfather in a cabin with a dirt floor. But when it got cold at night, he had to crawl up in a feed bag to try and be warm. Um, and then when he was around six years old, he was taken away from his grandmother and sent to another plantation. But his mom would sneak in by nights. She'd come in at night to see her baby, sleep with him, even breastfeed him, and then go away before the morning came. So he used to say, I never saw my mother during the daylight hours. I think his mom died when he was about 14 or so. And his father died either shortly before or thereafter. And here's this young man, both parents gone, taken away from his grandparents and put to slave on various plantations where he's being sold out to this one or loaned out to work with this one. And some of them turning out to be very abusive, just outright brutal. But he managed to escape because he met an angel, this beautiful black woman. And she was a free, his wife was a free woman. She was a part of the community in Baltimore. And she was able to help him escape from slavery. He didn't just get away on his own. You know, Anna Murray Douglas, whom he was married to for 44 years, she was the one that got him the clothing so he could dress up like a sailor. And she was the one that gave him the money so he could pay his passage on the trains and the boats or ferries, whatever he had to do so that he could get away and get out of the South. And not much is said about the role of this woman in the escape. We usually see how Fred Douglas escaped and he's, there's a photograph of him with a stick on his back with a bag hanging on the stick, but that's not how he escaped. He was dressed up as a sailor and, and other blacks in the North who was a part of the abolition movement had given him papers, false identification papers showing that he was a sailor in the American Navy. And so he was able to get on the border, to get on the train and go into uh, Baltimore, go into Philadelphia and finally landing in New York where his wife-to-be would join him and they would be married there at a black church um, and live together, husband and wife for the next 44 years, working together for the next 44 years and him working on until he was 78 years old. So just thinking of him being any young African-American man and Sister Anna being any young African-American woman doing slavery, she happened to be free through whatever means her family had used, either bought their way out of freedom or was granted manumission by a, a slave owner who had some compassion. And him being in the thralls of being abused and beaten and mis mal malnutrition and all of the other things that came with the punishment for those who were trying to break you. He said on one occasion that the beatings were so bad that he felt his spirit was broken, his heart was broken, and his body was broken. But he still survived. Part of why he survived, he met that beautiful black woman. And brothers, I hope you'll take a hint from Frederick. He met this beautiful black woman when he thought he was done. And she told him, no, you're more than that. And she helped him escape slavery. And he became one of the most extraordinary leaders for nearly the next close to 50 years of our people. This is a man who would come to the North. And I'm gonna just show you how great he was 
I'm going to just read off the accolades from back in those days right up to today that this man is receiving and we know so little about. But when you listen to some of this, it's just mind, mind blowing. In 1871, a bus of Douglas was unveiled at Sibley Hall in the University of Rochester. In 1895, the first hospital for black people in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was named the Frederick Douglass Memorial Hospital. The medical professionals included from all other facilities were trained and employed here. These are the blacks who could not work in white facilities. And that hospital in 1948 merged with um, Mercy Hospital and become the Mercy Douglas Hospital. In 1899, a statue of Frederick Douglass was unveiled in Rochester, New York. Again, in 1921, a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, the first African-American intercollegiate fraternity that we know about, and Douglass was made a posthumous member of that fraternity. In 1962, his home in Anacosta, Washington became a part of the national park system. 1965, the United States Postal Service honored him with a stamp. In 1999, Yale University established the Frederick Douglass Book Prize for works in the history of slavery and abolition. In 2002, scholar Malefi Keti Asante named Frederick Douglass to his list of 100 greatest African Americans. 2003, Frederick Douglass placed the rental housing unit that Douglass built in Baltimore in, eight, listen to this now, 1892 for Blacks. 1892, this guy is building housing for Black folks. We're still struggling with the issue of proper housing today, but he does this in 1892. And that, that facility is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 2007, the former Troop Hollow Bridge, which carried Interstate 490 over the, the Genesis River in Rochester, was redesigned and renamed the Frederick Douglass Susan B. Anthony Bridge. And it just goes on. This guy is still getting accolades today, and we haven't paid him much attention. In 2010, the Frederick Douglass Memorial was unveiled in Frederick Douglass Circle in the Northwest corner of Central Park in New York City. In 2010, the New York Writers Hall of Fame inducted Douglas in its inaugural class. On June 12, 2011, Talbot County, Maryland installed a seven foot, two meter bronze statue of Douglas on the lawn of the county courthouse in Eston, Maryland. In 2013, a statue of Douglas by Maryland artist Stephen Weitzman was unveiled in the United States Capitol Visitor Center. On 2014, under the leadership of Governor Martin O'Malley, a portrait of Frederick Douglass was unveiled at his office resident in Annapolis, Maryland. In 2015, the University of Maryland dedicated Frederick Douglass Plaza. In 2016, the Council of the District of Columbia voted that the city's new name as a state is to be Washington, D.C., and the DC is to stand for Douglas Commonwealth. So people are still honoring him and the black community needs to get to know him better. In 2018, he was awarded an honorary law degree from the University of Rochester. In 2019, Newcastle University opened the Frederick Douglass Center and it just goes on and on. And this young man wrote three books well, really four, but it's, he wrote three versions of his autobiography. First, uh, I think it was in, in um, the, 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 the first um, one, I think was in what? 80, he was 23 years old when he did that first one. Then he revised that, did a second one a few years later and then revised that later on. And all of them was considered to be extraordinary in terms of the literature. He traveled out of the country. He traveled to Scotland, to England. He lived for two years in Ireland um, and was teaching there about slavery in the world. He was a lecturer on the anti-slavery circuit in the UK. Um, and when he came back to America after that two years hiatus of living abroad, 
where he had to go for the safety of his life, he, he came back and he started his newspaper, The North Star, which became one of the most popular newspapers in America at that time. And when he initially started, he started it with Martin Delaney, but he thought Delaney was too lazy. And I happen to love Martin Delaney, but he thought Delaney didn't bring in enough um, revenue. He didn't do a, get, a, get enough advertising. So he, he broke with Delaney. But he became one of the primary advocates for the end of slavery in America at that time in history, working with Garrison and the anti-slavery uh, movement in the North. Um, it's, it's just, there's just so much about this man. When you look at his work, you'll see that when John Brown is planning Harper's Ferry, he has multiple meetings with Frederick Douglass. And Douglass talk about this in his third autobiography. Um, and he talked about the last meeting he had with John Brown when he told Brown, it appeared that this operation would not be successful. And he tried to spend over 20 hours, 48 hours actually, he says, to try and get John Brown from carrying on the operation. But Brown decided to do it anyway. And I know when we saw the movie and when we read the book, there's a young man named Greenlee who's with John Brown. That's the young man who had been staying for months with Frederick Douglass until they had that meeting. And he decided to go with Brown in the attempt at Hoppers Ferry to, to get that arsenal and foster a slave rebellion, which did not work, but was one of the things that led to the Civil War that would come shortly afterwards. So you'll find that he's involved in the pushing for the 15th Amendment, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. He was involved in everything. He was very close with President Lincoln, and in many ways an advisor to President Lincoln. He was the one instrumental in getting Lincoln to allow for black soldiers to fight for their freedom in the Civil War. So the Massachusetts 54th was formed. Over 200,000 of our people fought in that war from the Northern sector. Another half a million fought from the Southern sector. So we freed ourselves. We were nearly a million strong. In the South, we worked to do the hard labor for the Union Army drive the wagons, move the cargo, build the housing and so forth, build the camps. And many of us carried arms. And so Douglas was one of the people who advocated for that to happen. Lincoln finally made it happen. He was one of the people who advocate for Lincoln to push the Emancipation Proclamation. And that happened. And it changed the whole course of history because initially Lincoln was not for freeing of the slave. He was trying to save the Union. And Douglas was the one that pushed the position, you can't save the Union unless you free the slaves, you know? And so when we think of this man um, in this day and time, um, being able to come out of slavery and grow to that posture to where you can travel into Europe and take the plight of your people and articulate it to, to the Europeans. Um, he was so, he felt that some of the white churches were so hypocritical while in Europe, he lobbied for the European community not to um, financially support any of the white church denominations that was not pro-emancipation of slavery in America. That's a courageous thing to do back in the day. But there was Mr. Douglas doing these things. And during the Civil War, three of his sons fought in the American military in the Civil War, three. So he, was, he didn't just give his word. He was the main recruiter and his sons, two of them was in uniform and one was a primary recruiter for the armor, army to get the colored troops into the military. So when we think of, of the Civil War, normally people made us think that others volunteered to come and free us. But when you see the role of Douglas and his family, and the abolitionist movement and the other black communities in America. And at that time, the black free community in America, like I said, is over 200,000 people. And all of those people saw this man as their leader, most of them, I'd say 90%. And these are the people that were supporting his efforts. And so we see a history get transformed and get changed, but sometimes we're not told why the transformation takes place. 
you know, after he didn't initially in the second, after after the emancipation and everything, he didn't support Lincoln in the second election. He voted for another man because he didn't feel Lincoln was strong enough on getting the black vote. So he voted for another candidate who of course lost uh, to Lincoln, um, but he stayed close close to Lincoln um, until the day Lincoln died. He, he was close uh, to Lincoln as an advisor. There was an occasion where he gave a speech. I think this was that um, after Lincoln's death and Lincoln's wife thought that the speech, in the speech he was both critical and praising of Lincoln. And it was an extraordinary speech. Some think it's one of his best speeches, but he was trying to show what Lincoln was going up against. And he referred to Lincoln as being the white man's president in terms of his intellectual behavior, but the people's president in terms of his heart. And the speech was so fantastic that Lincoln's wife gave him uh, the president's walking stick. As, as a gift for such an extraordinary speech that did an analysis of her husband's role in that heavy conflict that he had to straddle and Lincoln, I mean, had to straddle that line uh, between uh, what we now call white supremacy and enslavement and what we call, you know, the Northerners, businessmen who were actually financing the enslavement in the South, but pretending they were, or, uh, human suffrage and human rights around the, the entire country. And Lincoln had to walk in between those two lines, um, which did cost him his life at the end of the day. Um, but he caused the change in America. And with the help of Frederick Douglass, the Emancipation Proclamation and what followed in terms of the 13th, the 14th and 15th Amendment, you know, giving us our freedom and then giving us the right to vote. Um, those were extraordinary works that Douglas worked on, worked to support. Um, he was one of the leaders, believe it or not, in women's suffrage. The first woman's meeting, I think it was in Schenectady or up in New York, Douglas was the only black American there. And he made a speech at that meeting because most people was not for women's suffrage. And I think it was Miss Stanton who was the leader of the women's suffrage movement at that time. And she invited Douglas to speak. And it was his speech that turned the tide and got the, con the, the convention to vote for women's suffrage and really gave a thrust to the beginning of the woman's uh, struggle in America for the vote. But he would split with Stanton later on when uh, I think went around the issue of the 14th Amendment um, when the, the issue of the black male vote being granted. And Stanton wanted him to take the position that if the woman isn't given the right to vote, then blacks should not, should deny it, not want it. And his position was no, that we've got to take what victories we can get. So he says, I'm for black, the black males getting the right to vote. And then he explained it. He said, white woman, the white women population, you are getting the residuals from the white man being able to vote. The black woman is not getting that at all. And so if the black man is able to vote, then the black woman will get the residuals from the black man having the right to vote. And then we can take the next step of fighting for women's suffrage. But he continued fighting for women's suffrage throughout his life and was one of the leaders in that movement. It's hard to tell today because no one talks about him as being one of the leaders in the women's fight for vote in America. But that's why we've got to study our own history and study our own leaders so we can have a sense of the things that they they do, you know. And even when President Grant took over after, well, first Johnson, who takes over after the assassination of Lincoln, Douglas met with Johnson, who was a Southerner, to try and, and make sure that the rights of Blacks in the South could be protected. And when Grant got into office, he made partnership with General Grant, who was then the president, to try to ensure the rights of the black population that had just been freed in the South. And when we lost the battle of reconstruction, you know, he again picked up the fight 
And one of the things he, he, he did throughout that period was to fight for Blacks to have access to education. You know, that he, he, and he said it in a number of speeches that education was one of the primary ways Blacks would achieve freedom in America. And he criticized, he, actually he thought that the denial, and he said this in a speech, that the denial of education was more cruel than the whip on the backs of the enslaved Africans. He saw education as being that significant and that important, and he wrote about it in that sense. So he had a, a, a deep vision, a deep understanding of what it was gonna take to move a people forward, because he had moved himself forward using this pathway. And so we get this extraordinary Mr. Douglas, who you're gonna learn a little bit about his uh, time in Plainfield and his time in New Jersey uh, during the period of his struggling and his role. He was very uh, eminent in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And most people don't know he was a licensed minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And um, he actually preached for a number of years and had risen to the level of what they call a Saxton, I guess that, I don't know much about church structure, but for that church, it was a very high position. Um, so he believed heavily in the Bible. Um, he believed Christianity could work. He criticized the Christian community in America heavily as being hypocrites, because he said that the Christianity of America was not the Christianity of Christ. And so he was a very strong Christian advocate in that regard, because he felt the Bible gave us one position and the theologians was given us another. And he fought against that position openly, which was not something easy to do in America in that day and time. But Frederick Douglass did that. And so this man who walked us, walked himself out of slavery with the help of his wife, who became one of the leaders in the advocacy of the ending of slavery in the country, who became advisor to multiple presidents, who became a writer and had his book to be considered the best seller in the country in that day and time, who would end up finally being ambassador from the United States to Haiti in his latter years. This man, this African-American man who was a model of how you fight for freedom, who was a model, he was to me, Malcolm and Dr. King, all wrapped in one package. And before Rosa Parks, he was thrown off of a train in I think Worcester, Massachusetts, because he refused to ride in the segregated car. So the battles we are fighting today were some of the battles that these young people, when they were young people, was fighting back in that day. And when we look at some of the issues that he raises, the voting rights issues, the education issues, the, the accommodation and public transportation issues, these are things that we've seen in our lifetime. And yet Frederick Douglass was trying to handle these things in his lifetime. We saw him fighting to get others out of slavery working with the Underground Railroad to move people to safety, even up to Canada. There was an occasion where they took out a warrant in Virginia for his arrest after Harper's Ferry. And he had to leave the country for a second time, going to Canada first, and then going into uh, England for one year, and then coming back to America. Uh, so we need to look at Fred Douglas with some new eyes. And, and, and show you how far reaching his efforts were. When Marcus Garvey comes to America and Marcus Garvey was invited by Booker T. Washington. Now one of Frederick Douglass' children married one of Booker T. Washington's children. So Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass was on the same page and carrying on the same work. But because people like to separate our people say Garvey's over here and Booker's over here and the boys is over here and Booker. And that's not true when you study history. You see a whole different relationship between these men. You know? Because when Garvey gets to the country, 
And at this time, Booker has been assassinated. Uh, Douglas is gone. But a black woman out of Washington, D.C., named Henrietta Benton Davis, who was a protege of Frederick Douglass, becomes the number two person in Garvey's UNIA and was able to use the Garvey platform in the AME Zion Church to move Garvey around America to take his message and to able, and with the Booker T. Washington connection to Mr. Douglas and to Henrietta Benton Davis, they were able to, and Booker Washington being a friend of Mr. Garvey, having invited him here, was able to use the Booker Washington communication network because Booker controlled every black press in this country, except the one of uh, Monroe Trotter up in Massachusetts. And Garvey inherits all of that to make up his UNIA. So you can still see Frederick Douglass in the midst of Garvey and the UNIA. You understand? If Malcolm X learned from Garvey, which he did, and Elijah Muhammad learned from Garvey, Garvey learned from Frederick Douglass. And so when you can make these connections and look through history and see such an extraordinary figure that was able to stand for such a long period of time, imagine you're in this movement as a late teen, 15 years old, 16 years old, and you're still leading at 76 years old, 77 years old, as Frederick Douglass did. Um, never taking a back step. Um, laying out some of the most intellectually rational reasons for why African-Americans need to own America and not let anybody uh, make us feel we don't belong here when we built this before most other white ethnics had migrated here. And so, and he was very clear and very strong on that. Um, and he would later get others to be in that same posture with him. But I think one of the greatest things that he did for us was to teach us how to organize to resist. The resistance movement that he was able to organize with Garrison and Delaney and others at that time um, haven't been matched by modern movements. Um, the Panther Party was beautiful. The Nation of Islam was fantastic. What Dr. King did with the SCLC was extraordinary. But what this one guy did in bringing together all of the other black organizations that existed at that time, the United African Movement, the Prince Hall Freemason or, or, or the African Free Lodge, the AME Zion Church and the AME Church. Um, because at that time, the church was our primary sanctuary, was our primary organization. And so those are the instruments he's working with. He's working with the Prince Hall Masons. He's working with the AME Zion Church. He's working with the AME Church. He's working with the United African Society. He's working with an eight, what, what is it called? Um, it later became the Afro-American League under T. Thomas Fortune. But it was started by some black women in Rochester, uh, New York. And it was called the Afro-American Society. And a lot of people don't know that the organization was he had a hand on in its beginning in the 1800s would become the Niagara movement and then evolve into the NACP, the same organization. So Frederick Douglass was a very influential person in how we got to where we are today. Um, and to be able to tutor other young blacks and to lead uh, that that propaganda movement against slavery and the way he was able to do with the North Star and later changing the name of the newspaper to the Frederick Douglass Press um, was extraordinary for that day and time. Um, and to face, remember, he was one of the most wanted men in America at that time by the Southerners. They wanted him dead or alive. They wanted to take him back into slavery to humiliate him, and they were unable to do that because he was wise enough to leave the country when the danger got to be too much. But he came back home, even though others told him not to come back to America. After two years, he came back and pick up the fight just like he did before he left. And so we owe him a lot of things. We owe him the, the, the posture that, that 
place African American by getting Lincoln to put us into the war, let us wear that uniform and carry that guns. And then he had to fight because once he got the black soldiers in the war, the government didn't want to pay them. And many of our people were out there fighting without having boots or shoes on their feet. But they fought anyway, barefooted. They fought anyway, even though they weren't getting the same pay as the white. And even when he finally got Lincoln to pay them, they never did get paid at the same rate as the white soldiers. So these kinds of struggles that we're fighting for even today, we saw Douglas fighting for back then. And so we should be very proud to know that we had this fantastic advocate on this fantastic young man who showed that slavery did not kill you as a man. Matter of fact, in one of his quotes, he said that um, he wanted to show how slavery could make you a brute, but how that same slavery can make you a man and you're fighting against it. How you achieve your manhood in fighting against the tyranny. And he saw that and spoke about that, that you must fight against tyranny to achieve the place of dignity that you need to be in a society. And he proved it with his life. Um, he was probably one of the most prolific speaker of that day, black or white. He was, and the other thing he saw, you know, we always said Malcolm X mastered the soundbite that, that, um, Madison Avenue later used for his advertising. Well, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed man in America in the 19th century. One would not think of that, but why is this one black man the most photographed man in America in the 19th century? Because he thought that the visual, just as we now look at a YouTube and some of the other media things in social media and we're using the visual as we're doing right now. He saw the, the, the strength of the photograph as being a powerful political tool and he used it well. Thus he was the most photographed person in America during the 19th century, black or white. More photographed than any president of his time because he saw the power of how to use imagery to project messages and symbols into people's consciousness. Um, and he was deliberate about it. He, was, he knew what he was doing. It wasn't an accident of history. Um, he was very deliberate. Um, and he believed in his children. Matter of fact, he, in some of his writing in the right, he wrote a letter to his former enslaver and he chastised the former enslaver for the brutality against him and his family. And he criticized him. That's, that's why he wrote that piece of the greatest crime you committed wasn't beating me with the whip, but denying us access to education. And then he talked about his children and how he had raised his children to be free human beings, but to be human beings and to be educated and to be intellectual and skilled and tools. Um, because he believed in education as being one of the major tools to liberation. Um, one would think that kind of thinking you could hear today, but that was the thinking of Frederick Douglass. And so he's worth studying. His biography is worth reading. There's multiple books written on him. The one I like most is called The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, His Early Life as a Slave, His Escape from Bondage, and His History Complete. This book, if you can get it, you will be wonderfully intrigued. And there's a number of nice books out that are narrated just for children that you should give to your kids and make sure the children learn about this man that was fighting for their freedom even before slavery had ended and that the extraordinary way he did that work for them. So what can we say about Frederick Douglass more? Um, I think Brother Payne has some things that he wants to bring forward in terms of his slides to show how Douglas touched your community in Plainfield. And I think that's important for you to understand because this is an abstraction. He was a part of the very life you are now living in your hometown. So Brother Payne, you're there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you yes, hear me? 
Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Smalls. And it's pine. It's pine. I'm a pain sometimes. Pine, pine. <laughs> I'm sorry about the pine. That's okay. That's okay. I know about the pain. <laughs> but, pine. Um, I just want to share. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Michael Pine. I'm with the Frontiers Plainfield Area Club. And, you know, as this topic came about, we started doing some research on Frederick Douglass and the area that we live in, uh, Central Jersey, Plainfield, New Jersey. And it so happens that uh, Frederick Douglass is, has been here um, on a few occasions. And uh, we know that the Underground Railroad somewhat skirted the Plainfield area. But when we dig some, we did some dig, deep digging with the Plainfield Historical Society, and uh, <clears throat> we're still working on the details as to whether there's an underground railroad stop or not here in a city. What we did find, though, that there was a, a well-known abolitionist, okay, there's a well-known abolitionist out of New York that eventually moved to, the, to Plainfield and settled here. And he was a good friend and colleague and admirer of the great Frederick Douglass, okay? His name was Ethan Lampier. And his house still stands on Central and West Fifth Street. Okay, so Ethan is from the Allegheny County area of New York, and uh, he and his family uh, were ardent supporters of the Underground Movement, the Underground Railroad Movement. Uh, Ethan uh, uh, moved to this area. He he visited a lot of he had a lot of friends and family in the area, so he. He's been here on many occasions back in the 1840s, 1847 to be exact. And so he talks about uh, the abolitionist movement in upstate New York. And then he talks about housing runaway slaves, including Frederick Douglass and others that he has housed over the years. And uh, so when he landed in Plainfield and set up uh, his home, uh, it so happened that he was also a host for Frederick Douglass when he visited this area. Uh, as, as Professor Smalls mentioned, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass left this country and went to England, to Britain and in, in Ireland. And from there, uh, the, the group there, the abolitionists there bought his freedom. OK, uh, at the time, it was around seven hundred dollars, which equate to something in the forty thousand dollar range today. But they bought his freedom. That was around 1847. And uh, he came back to the United States. And it so happens that two years later, he was in this area. So we know that there's a connection with uh, Frederick Douglass, the movement, uh, the Plainfield area, the Newark area, because he did speak in Newark in 1849. So I put together a little timeline. I'm not sure if that's the one that uh, is being showed there, but um, just to touch on some, some key things. So Ethan Lampier, um, uh, I mentioned he and his family were here in the, in the 1847s. Um, Frederick Douglass spoke in Newark in 1849, shortly after returning from Europe. And then uh, Ethan came back later on and built homes in Plainfield. He built three homes. One was his, was his main home. And that main house, uh, we believe, is where um, he hosted Frederick Douglass. Now, that, ho that house still stands. And I'm working uh, currently with the Plainfield Historical Society. Um, there it is. And so happens that uh, there is uh, the, the church that's in that vicinity, which for those in Plainfield that knows the old um, Board of Ed building, that used to be the um, Seventh-day Baptist National Headquarters. So the Seventh-day Baptist was also a big proponent of abolition, okay? And so it's, it's interesting to know that the headquarters was right there on Fifth Street. Okay, which is a two two buildings down from where this house stands today. Um, now, the greatness of Frederick Douglass, as we know, <clears throat> you know, he makes he conferred with um, Abraham Lincoln on many occasions, and so he impressed upon everyone the need to uh, free. There's a there's a photo of Ethan Lampier. So Ethan, um, as I mentioned, was an abolitionist. Uh, he was a farmer in upstate New York and a Seventh Day Baptist. He did uh, migrate to this area. Um, and this is one of the key uh, supporters of, of um, Frederick Douglass and others. He, I mean, Frederick Douglass, as we know, was the front person that spoke well. He was a very good orator. Um, some of the writings that I'm coming across, you know, if you notice, you will never see a photo 
uh, of Frederick Douglass smiling. And he said we were in difficult times. Uh, he did not want to show any uh, buffoonery, anything along those lines. Uh, these are serious times. So most of his photos, you will never see him smiling. And that's that's something to be um, understood. So yeah, Ethan built, Ethan Lampier, the, the, the fellow that you see there, uh, he built uh, three homes in Plainfield uh, in the 1860s. Uh, we know the Civil War was going on between 61 and 65. His brother served, Ethan's brother served in the Union Army. And so Ethan authored two books that speaks to his travels throughout the, the, the country and the conditions of not only African-Americans. Let's, let's face it, back in that time, uh, you know, there's a lot of poor whites that didn't understand, uh, you know, why things were the way they were, but because the power brokers used everyone, okay? But the slaves uh, in particular were at the bottom of the totem pole, okay? Um, so I mentioned Frederick Douglass uh, spoke with uh, Abraham Lincoln on an, em emancipation, and this was in 1863, and two years later, uh, we, we have slavery, slavery being abolished, right? Uh, in December of 1872, Frederick Douglass came and spoke um, in, in Plainfield. Actually, he came twice that we know of that's recorded in our uh, newspaper clippings. Uh, in, in 1872 at the YMCA, that was snowed out. So he came back the following uh, spring in, in, uh, in March of 1873. Okay. Um, in 1876, he delivers a keynote uh, anniversary speech on emancipation to the nation. And, and so that, that particular speech, um, I'm not sure if there's any audio out there available, but uh, I know it was moving to the point of, you know, America was realizing that together as a, as a, as a, as a people, if the, you know, free the, the African-American and allow them to prosper would benefit everyone, especially the country. Um, in 1895, uh, Frederick Douglass uh, passes, and uh, Ethan, Ethan and, Doug, and Frederick were the same age, and, and he, uh, Ethan um, Lampier passed along a few years later. Um, one last note, um, and here's a quote that most are familiar with, but probably didn't know where it originated, but this originated from Frederick Douglass, right? Power concedes nothing without a demand. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, it never will. Frederick Douglass. Thank you, Safir. Oh, that's the home. That's the home on Central Avenue. That's uh, Ethan and his wife uh, later on in life, uh, standing on the same the same porch that you're seeing in the other picture, on Central and, and Fifth. Okay, that was wonderful. Now, I hope Plainfield see how they fit in history. You're yes, bigger in the history than you think, and your community was on the front line in fighting for Black freedom when it wasn't even popular to fight for Black freedom. Right. You know, I mentioned the letter <laughs> that Douglas wrote to his former slave master. I'd like to read a short excerpt from that, sure. just so you can hear the level of, of, of sophistication in the oratory. He says, oh, sir, a slaveholder never appeared to me so completely an agent of hell as when I think of and look upon my dear children. It is then that my feeling rise above my control. The grim horrors of slavery rise in all their ghastly terror before me. The wails of millions pierce my heart and chill my blood. I remember the chain, the gag, the bloody whip, the death-like gloom overshadowing the broken spirits of the fettered bondman, the appalling liability of his being torn away from wife and children and sold like a beast in the market. That brother could write. A Mary Baraka, <laughs> and they, they may have thought they, they came up with the style, but here it is with Frederick Douglass. And then he, 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 he suggests, you know, further, he said, in this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the graduation, and he, he's talking now, he's trying to get people to um, understand why they need to fight for women's rights to vote in the country. And while he's at that meeting with Stanton, he makes this statement. 
He said, and it is the denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of women and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the governments of the world. <laughs> this guy is talking back in 1848, you know, this, this extraordinary man. And when General Grant gets in there in power, you know, he's lobbying Grant because Grant and Douglas is lobbying. We, are, we had just had the Haitian Revolution and the great Haitian leader had been assassinated, uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. But Douglas is, is um, lobbying General Grant to annex what is now the Dominican Republic and Haiti and make it a part of the United States. Because this was a black world so that black people would then have their own state. So what we heard Malcolm X talking about and Elijah Muhammad talking about decades and decades later, Douglas is already trying to push this concept and on, on Grant back then. Now Grant, they tried, and I remember Senator Sumner was one of the persons in Congress that was fighting against this, and Douglas had to come out very publicly in both newspaper and oratory criticizing Senator Sumner and considering him one of the most evil persons in the world for opposing uh, to get this amendment passed so that Haiti would be a part of the United States and that the blacks in the United States could make Haiti, what is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic, their own black state. Um, extraordinary to think that he was thinking that in those days before the term Pan-Africanism was even coined by Du Bois and others and Padmore. So this man was way ahead of the curve in terms of how you look structurally at how the world should be working with black people in it. And he also lobbied and worked with Grant very strongly after that midterm election when Grant signed the Civil Rights Act of 1871, also known as the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan Act. And Grant, you know, sent troops into the South and thousands of whites were arrested for their participation in the Klan. And Douglas was the, a direct advocate behind that. So we owe him a lot. And I think his name need to be raised more often in the frontiers, you've done a good job in raising him on this Black History Month. And I want to say to people something about Black History Month. Stop complaining about it being the shortest month. If you only had one day, use it. But whites did not give us Black History Month. Black people gave us this month. And the reason Black History Month was chosen because it was the month that Frederick Douglass was born and it was the month that he died. And it was the month that contained the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. So in the 1930s, they thought this was the best chance to get Negro History Week recognized if it was placed at this particular period in the calendar year. And that's how we ended up in February, not because someone else gave us this. It was the historical society that, um, um, oh, our brother who, the miseducation of the Negro, um, that he led, that gave us Black History Week, that be become Black History Month. And they, it was chosen primarily because it was the birthday month of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. So it was just something we need to know. And that it is our place to make Black History Month Black History Year, because we should be teaching these Blacks to our children in our homes every day set aside at least an hour a week just to have a discussion on the history of our people, especially and particularly in North America, but as well as our people history before we left the continent of Africa, so that our children can be fortified. Because I think it was Dr. Hilliard that said, true freedom is to be shackled to your identity. Well, if you don't know your history, you don't know your identity. And Frederick Douglass, and I'm sure many have seen just in our light discussion today with his involvement with an extraordinary African, not just in black history, but in the history of America, an extraordinary African that was involved in the policies of America from the highest level. This man is involved in the Emancipation Proclamation. This man is involved in the Civil Rights Act of 1871. 
This man is involved in getting blacks to get in uniforms and fight in the Civil War and send three of his children to fight in that war. This man is involved with Garrison and the Underground Railroad and Harriet Tubman and, and others in getting us freed from slavery before the institution was destroyed. And yet he still had a vision to look at Haiti and look at the, what is now the Dominican Republic. At that time, uh, the whole thing was Haiti. And he was trying to get it annexed as one as a part of the United States so that the blacks in the United States would have a place that they could be a part of that was theirs. That was far thinking for that day. But yet this extraordinary young man was there. And he was in your hometown. And he worked with others who was in your hometown. Because the movement wasn't an individual. He was just one of the critical leadership of a movement of people, black and white fighting for freedom uh, for the African people, and at the end, fighting for freedom for the American people. Because as long as Africans was enslaved and not free, no white American was truly free either. And until we reckon with the disparity right now between the, this position of blacks and whites and get it right and get it to be American, um, no one in America will be free. No one in America will be safe. You, we talk about gun violence, gun violence, and mass shootings. And you could take away all the guns in the world, people will kill with something else because it is the mind of the human being that's doing this and not the instrument the human being is using. And so we have to find out then what is wrong with the mind of the human being. And maybe it is as simple as telling the truth about the historical experiences and relationship between the peoples that made up this country, right? and the processes that led to us being where we are today. Despite all of the negative contradiction, we're still one of the greatest countries on the planet Earth, or at least the potential to be the greatest country on the planet Earth. But we need to deal with the accepting the truth, that idiom out of the Bible, know the truth and the truth shall set you free, that truth alone shall set you free, is very true. And until Africans roll, the African role in the making and the creating and the sustaining and the projecting of America is told in the history of America and all of our public schools. It will not solve the problem of the hatred and violence between people. And like Malcolm X says, the chickens will come home to roost. If you practice hatred and violence against others, you will also practice that same hatred and violence against yourself and your kind. And so we need to seriously look at African history. Uh, we need to seriously looking, as we are looking at the life of Fred Douglas, look at the life of so many other Africans that have made this country what it is today. And certainly Douglas stands at the top of the, the, the mountain and being one of those persons. So I hope that we've said something worthwhile. And I'd like to thank my brother for this beautiful timeline was just on, on. And timeline is a good teaching tool. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to just share my sentiments on Douglas. Um, I thought he was great, but now I, I really know he was an extraordinarily great man. So thank yes, you. and Professor Small, thank you so much for all that you poured into us today. Uh, certainly the life of Frederick Douglass is one that is marked by greatness, one that is marked by a profound sense of belonging, even in a place where the societal norms was that we did not, at least they suggested that. Uh, you said some remarkable things when you were giving your presentation, uh, one of which was the fact that uh, there's work to do when it comes to getting the human mind uh, resolved with its own issues here, especially in the American society, where there's this large campaign of misinformation and now disinformation. Um, books are being banned from our public schools. Um, and in fact, there are books even now that are being peddled that would even contend with the facts of our history. So we both recognize that in order for America to move forward and to really bridge the gap between the division that has been wrought for so long uh, between the American Blacks, the American Whites, and any other groups 
uh, that division is very clear. The question, though, that I'd like to pose for you, Professor Small, is how can we begin to dismantle uh, those obstacles that currently exist to which prevent us getting the truth heard and, and broadly accepted? Okay, let's use some of the institutional framework that Douglas and others used and get um, the things that they do. Let me just lay out a couple of things. The African-American community last year is recorded as having spent $1.8 trillion, which makes us the 12th or 13th wealthiest nation in the world. It makes us, we our wealth last year was greater GDP of Canada or Saudi Arabia. Did we know that? And with this extraordinary wealth, why, or extraordinary riches, why don't we have the wealth? And so the African-American community, who our country says is about 40 something million, which is ridiculous. But if we just take the 40 something million and they said we didn't count 20% in the censors and throw them in, then we are about 60 something million, which the government agrees to, right? Um, and this, I have to preface it with this, right? And if you bring in the African Latino, see, we're the only people, if our people speak another language, they don't count them with us, all right? Whites come from England, they count it as white Americans. Whites come from uh, Germany and speak German, they count it white Americans. Whites come from um, Italy and speak Italian. They, but if you don't, when blacks come from a country where they speak Spanish, they don't count those millions of blacks as black Americans. Blacks come from a yeah. country that speak French, they don't count those millions. And if you do that, we're the largest group in America. We're not the minority. We'd be more than 120 million people. Hmm. All right. We are the majority of America already. And that's where the problem lies. Okay. Hmm. And I hope you all are hearing me because hmm. then you'll understand what the hatred is about. Even though we have not practiced vengeance against anybody for the crime and the genocide committed against us that they call slavery. Slavery was genocide just like the concentration camps in Germany and the Holocaust was genocide. Slavery is with genocide, the difference between Germany and here, Germany lasts how long? 20 years. Slavery in America was 250 years of that genocide and it continued in a modified form called Jim Crow and even sometimes more vicious genocide, which makes it 350 years of genocide that people want to pretend never happened which is the other part of the problem. So here's my solution offered. Having taught in the Black Studies Department under Leonard Jeffries at City College for 18 years, um, Black people need to take the teachings of their history to their churches and to their living room. Because until the African population, until the African-American population develop the dignity, self-respect, self-value, and self-worth from the knowing of history, you don't have the strength or the integrity to demand that other people do so. You want someone to love you more than you love yourself. You want someone to give you a credibility that you're not willing to give to yourself. Okay. We can watch wow. Netflix any given week we want to. No, no dispersing. I love Netflix. I think there's a good movie on there, the African Queen in Zengia, in Zenga, we need to watch. But why can't we have an hour set aside a week in our homes? If every black home did this, where we watch a video or read a speech of Dr. King or read a speech of Malcolm and read a speech of Douglas or of Harriet Tubman or Sojourner Truth and analyze it with our children and talk about what these people were doing to make our lives better. If we did that, we would change the world in a month. Wow. Okay. In a month. If the black churches open its doors to after schools that teach our children math, science, and their history, we will change the black community in a way. We would change America. You understand? Because right. once you value yourself, 
you know how to value your worth. And at $1.8 trillion that came in our community and left in six hours will now come back in our community and stay six days or 16 days and make us one of the wealthiest communities in America. Wow. Wow. I mean, that, that's a remarkable and profound truth. Uh, it's one, obviously, that stings a bit, right? We, we've we gotten to this place in, in many ways through means that were outside of our control, uh, right. but now have amassed positions and, and wealth, as you've mentioned, uh, that we've been conditioned to spin quickly and allowed mm -hmm. to leave our communities. Mm -hmm. And it's all a result, really, of the fact that we don't understand our identity or don't even know it. And, and the reason we have the crime is because we have the unemployment. The reason we have the unemployment because the Black wealthy class and the Black middle class have abandoned the Black working class and the Black underclass. Because it's the wealth class and the middle class that build the, 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 the retail business and the hotel business that employ your working class. And so we, we've abandoned that element and left them for the drug dealers, hmm. and for the police recycling into the prison to keep people employed who lost their job because the greedy ones sent the, the, the industry overseas for cheap labor. Hmm. And even now, the, the, and no disrespect to anyone, but no one lets 12 million people cross their border illegally. So if we're getting that kind of crossing of the border, it is yeah. deliberate, my people, they're being allowed in for cheap slave labor. And mm. because black people, when we became, when we won the affirmative action bill, the next bill in America that was signed in Congress was the largest immigration bill in the history of America. Wow. Pay attention to the bouncing ball. You've been replaced in the workplace. You, I can walk around my hometown here in New Rochelle and where there's about 50 different constructions going on and not see two African-Americans working. What is wrong with that picture? Wow. And that is true across the country, okay? And almost every industry, because we wanted a union. We wanted um, better pay. We wanted insurance companies so you can bring other people in and misuse them. But thank God, after one generation, these people are fighting for the same things. Yeah. But I hope that they understand Stop allowing yourself to be used against the African-American population because we created the opportunity for you to have a space. You know, we've yeah. made America the freest country in the world for non-white people and for white people. And Frederick Douglass is a classic example of how that was done. Right? We were never racist. We never said we're doing this just for black people. We never said this is just about black freedom. Never. Mm. And Douglas was the best example of how we never did that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I, I wanted to throw all that in because I wanted it to make sense for today's world, for people to get it and understand it. Our community yeah. is the only one you can walk in, and all of the primary retail business is owned by people who do not live in your community mm. or invest in your community. Wow. You can say, okay, so you don't live here, but you're not going to invest here? No, further, you're not going to even hire me. You're bringing your nationals from other places. And if I boycott you, somebody will say racism in reverse. So, so Professor Small, I'm glad you brought that up. That, that leads me to one question. We do have one that came in, and I'll ask that in a moment. But mm -hmm. you talk about how businesses or business owners, uh, primarily small business owners or entrepreneurships, and even the larger corporations in our communities are typically not investing in those communities, they're not residents of those communities. They're not employing. That makes them those colonizers and enslaved. So, but the question then is this, right? So we do have elected officials in office in, mm -hmm. in many of our centers of um, Black civilization, really, because oftentimes we're relegated to specific areas within a state. Um, unless you're lucky and, like you said, you escape with this mindset that there's no reaching back or no need to try and reestablish footing where you've left the gap. But with the elected officials in place, right, isn't that a legislative issue where the businesses could have stipulations whereby they're either investing? Most, most, most of our black elected officials don't see themselves as black elected officials, except on mm -hmm. election time. 
they see themselves as members of the Democratic Party and they carry the greater Democratic agenda, which is almost always a white agenda, <laughs> white business agenda. And until we get black elected officials to understand that the persons who gave them the voting to get there, that's whose agenda they should be carrying. But then mm -hmm. it comes back to the black community and the black activists. We have to let those officials know you're a one-term official unless you service the community that elects you. As we elected you in office, we can elect somebody and get you out of office. But mm -hmm. the, the political parties, the Democratic parties, the Republican party have been an enemy to the black community. So when black people get elected, they serve the party's interests, but not mm -hmm. the community who elected them as interests. So wow. it, whoever lobby them and bring them the capital and buy them the little home in, in the islands or wherever they want to go and have their little whatever, whatever. Um, and I don't mind that, have fun, but serve me if I put you there. And we're not getting that from most. I said 90% of black elected officials do not serve the black community. Hmm. And that's why we have the issue. We have created a phenomenon that no other ethnic group in the history of the world have created in terms of carrying out a revolution that has mm -hmm. put us in every aspect of the government and the economic strata without an armed warfare to do it. And the people we put there feel no onus to the people mm -hmm. who come in there. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And we can change that by teaching the young people to use the vote. The vote is a fantastic tool. I advocate every young black man should join the American military for two years. Some people say, oh, small, that's not, no, no, no. I served in the military. My father served in the military. My grand uncle served in the military. My brother served in the military. Um, I'm a war resistor. I was in the military and refused to fight in Vietnam because it wasn't a war. We had not declared war and I thought it was a crime. And so I rather took my court martial, which I won, by the way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but it was on the technicality of the amount of time I had left, but I won anyway. You know, um, the point is that if the African American community is going to learn anything from a Frederick Douglass, you must put the emphasis on education that he put on education. All through his writings and his and his lectures, that emphasis on education is there from the day one, and he's very explicit with it. That education is one of the primary tools to our freedom. Yeah, because even with what you just talked about, where uh, the elected officials potentially are operating in the best interests of the communities by which they are elected, right? Uh, that also points to an education gap, uh, yeah. a trend which continues to get perpetuated, right? Because in our communities, I'm not, at least in the experience that I've witnessed, I haven't really seen civics education to the degree that it used to be when we were in elementary school. It's almost blown out. Yeah. So I advocate every day for civics to be put back in the schools. I have a son who's a principal of a school in Brooklyn, and he teaches African studies to every one of his children there. He teaches the classes himself. Okay. It's one of the few schools in the city where black studies is taught to every children in the city. And I know they're going to come after my boy, but when they do, they better realize they come after me and all that follows me. And I don't think they want that even though I'm an old man now, you know, because civics teaching the, the general population of how the government works, how city council works, how city hall works, how to bring uh, 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 an idea to a bill on the floor of Congress or the state assembly or the city council and then bringing it into law. Those are the things we learned when we were in school but they've taken it out because there's a question now to control the population, use them for the vote, but they never know what they're voting for or who they're voting for. Where did that guy come from that you're voting for? Where did that woman come from? Who's putting up the money behind them? Okay. And if you want somebody to run, how, where do you go to learn the election laws of your city, of your state? Where do you go to learn how to get on a ballot? Where do you go to learn how to put a petition before the assembly or the city hall? These are the kinds of things we need to teach our children, teach our young people. And there is no, if you go to Chinatown and no disparaging the Chinese people, I'm proud of y'all, do your thing. Or you go to the Jewish community, they own every business in their community. 
and they don't apologize to nobody for it. Their culture is displayed every day in their community and they don't have to uh, give an apology to anybody for celebrating themselves. God bless them. And look how well those communities are doing versus the us who don't do that. And we can't do that until we start studying our history. History will erase the mystery and allow you to work your black magic. And then you see that black magic ain't a bad thing at all. It's a beautiful thing. You know. All right, and then the, we did receive one other question which asks, where do we go from here? Who or what group is carrying the banner for equal rights and opportunity for the African in America? Well, there's no single group and there've never been a single group. The white media have tried to give us single people like they tried to give, Dr. King was an extraordinary and great leader, but he wasn't the only leader. Um, Malcolm was an extraordinary and great leader in the Northern sector, but he wasn't the only leader. There were multiple uh, other organizations in your community. And um, what I tell my people, join something, become a part of the PTA, become a part of the school board, become a part of whatever community organization is there. If you're in a church, join those things that give service to the community. If you get involved in giving service to your community, you will see all of the places that are available for you to expand your aspirations for giving that service. There's no mega black organization that's going to do this. We have to, or like somebody said a long time ago, all politics is local. And that starts with your PTA, school board, your housing committees, your land distribution committees, and these kinds of things in your community that's there, your sanitation committees. Do we go to these meetings? Do we insist that we get on these boards? We don't for the most part. And we just suffer from the lack of service because we have the opportunity to determine what that service is going to be. But that means you're going to have to take that hour away from the football game and the baseball game and the basketball game. And you got to go to that meeting at City Hall. Or you got to go to that meeting at the church. Or you got to go to that meeting at the lodge. And I tell people, join what you have. I'm a Prince Hall Mason. I'm very proud of being, yeah, I'm an African Senate Pan-African Prince Hall Mason. Have been for 30 something years. All my boys are Prince Hall Mason, because I believe in that. I believe in that as a service agent in the black community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of my family are Baptist Christians. And though I'm not a Baptist and a Christian, I still go to church. Now people can't reckon with that. Yeah, I go, because my sisters are telling me, you come down here, we're going to church. You ain't sitting up in this house, you go to church. Right? <laughs> I ain't got no problem with that. I understand God is God. God don't have no color, God don't have no race, God don't have no personage, okay? It's just cultural methodology and how you approach the divine. And so I'm cool with that. Um, but you've got to be a part of something in your community. Mm -hmm. And most of us aren't a part of anything in our community. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. Especially so, when it comes to the educational system. Big part of the problem. Agree. Agree. Uh, because divided, you cannot stand. So that yeah. certainly makes most sense. And, now, and there was let me another... Just say something else. We do have some... And NECP still exists. And it is a good yeah. body. Join it. The world. And then multiple civic organizations in every community, in the, make sure that you're a part of it, you know? And, and that way you're the engine of change in your community. And if something goes wrong, you're gonna see it before it reaches your doorstep, you know? The question is why is now young people employed? Why so many of our male young are coming out of high school can barely read and write? We have to address this. Say, yo, hold it, wait a minute, I'm paying somebody to do a job that they're not doing. And if you're not doing the job, if you're not giving me a product after 12 years that can read and write, get the heck out of my community. Go someplace else and pretend to be a teacher to get a good salary and a retirement fund while you have mutilated my children, mutilated my race, and mutilated my community, pretending to be educators. Let's get busy about it. I was the president of 
PTAs over eight times in my lifetime in four different schools. Because I was going to be wherever my children was, I'm up in there. Right? <laughs> That's right. And involved and engaged. Absolutely. So there's another question or request, if you would, where they're asking, could you compare Frederick Douglass to Marcus Garvey? I don't like to do that. They came at different times in history, but I would consider uh, Douglas the most. See, Garvey has been given a big play because of the size of the UNIA. But the UNIA, though it was a worldwide organization, it was not organized. You had chapters all over the world, but it wasn't being controlled by any central instrument. That's another discussion. Um, Garvey was here for a moment in time. He didn't have nearly the impact on Black people that a Douglas had or a Washington had. But Garvey has been pushed up to the front. And that's primarily because of the, the Marxist left who didn't want us to see a Douglas or a Washington and the work they did. See, what Douglas and Washington created i mean look 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 at we just went through some of the things about douglas the presidency in, in influence um the bills he influenced in congress um the actions of presidency influence the working with the underground railroad helping thousands of people get to freedom um going over the world and taking our plight to the world uh, you know i love um, Brother Garvey, but he came into a Black American movement that had been built by Frederick Douglass and, 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 and Booker T. Washington and Martin Delaney. He didn't create a movement. He became the leader of a movement because those men loved Garvey. Booker T. Washington invited him here. Booker T. Washington and the Douglass family was married to one another. The Douglass family um, was at the foundation of the AME movement, Zionist movement in this country. Um, Henrietta Benton Davis, who becomes Garvey number two person, was the, the Garvey protege out of DC. She was the one that opened up the Garvey network, not the Garvey, opened up the Douglas network to Garvey. So you can't compare them. They're actually extensions of one another in multiple kinds of ways, you know, in multiple kinds of ways. But we won't truly understand that until we know history. You know, there are those who've been our enemy, who've been writing radical history, political history, especially in the 20th century, who make us think the boys in Booker T. Washington or the boys in Garvey laying in the street wrestling with knives and stuff trying to kill each other. When you study history, that's not true. Did mm -hmm. they have a conflict? The boys in Garvey did have a conflict and it got nasty. But that was a moment in time. Booker and, and, and um, the boys did have a conflict. They were, they were critical of one another, but that didn't stop Booker Washington from going with the boys to, to England and then financing the Pan-African movements that the boys was trying to do. Do they talk about that? No. Or that these men were friends. Booker gave the boys his first job out of college. And the same thing with the boys and, and uh, Garvey and their contradiction. No, people said they had this nasty tete-a-tete. -tete. Yes. The boys felt that Garvey was a guest in his house mm -hmm. and did not respect the movement and the leadership of that movement in whose house he had came. And I agree with the boys. Okay. But there was a meeting with the Ku Klux Klan that precipitated the bitterness, the bitter argument that Garvey had had that the boys disagree with. But those are the kinds of things people need to do the research on and get the history on so we can define for ourselves what those men's relationship were and why they had contradictions. We all have contradictions today, but it doesn't mean we are enemies. We have a common cause and we're fighting for that common cause, sometimes battling each other in that fight. Um, Mr. Mr. Garvey was very clear. He said when he came to America, he said, I come to implement, according to Dr. Tony Martin, who's done more writing on Garvey than anyone, God bless Tony's soul. That was my brother and friend, Tony, said that Mr. Garvey said, I've come to implement the Tuskegee model. Want to hear that again? Mm -hmm. I've come to implement the Tuskegee 
model. That's what the UNIA is. So wow. others are going to come and wipe that out of our consciousness or wipe out Henrietta Benton Davis. Mm -hmm. Thank God I, I take some credit for bringing her name to the fore 20 years ago because nobody knew about this Frederick Douglass protege who was the number two person to Marcus Garvey. Wow. Wow. Well, I definitely want to take this moment, Professor Small, to thank you for all that you shared with us on today. Uh, we are coming up on the bottom of the hour, and I want to give you an opportunity to give any closing remarks to those who have joined us. Uh, immediately following that, I will give remarks and we'll close out our session for today. But again, thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Well, today the Frontiersman is presenting a Black history presentation to the community. I'm honored to be a part of that presentation. Um, we talked about today an extraordinary African and African-American man. And I preface that because we didn't stop being Africans when we left the continent and had babies here in North America. And yet we are African-Americans. America is our geopolitical place. Africa is our race. And that is not a contradiction. And for those who try to get us not to say that, they need to understand just as a person say, I'm from Jamaica, or one say, I'm from Trinidad, or one say, I'm from Haiti, I can say, I'm from America. All of us came from Africa, but we're one of the only people in America that has Africa as a part of this ethnic name. We call ourselves African Americans. And that's not something that started with Jesse Jackson. If you go back in our history, the first names we gave to any of our organization, the African Free Lives, the African Episcopal Church, the African Baptist Church, the, the United African Society, all through the 17 and 1800s, we called ourselves Africans. That's not something we developed in the 60s with the Black Nationalist Movement. In the beginning of the 20th century, when other European ethnic group who was fighting for their civil rights in America decided to hop on our backs like some are trying to do the day, today to further they, their cause, one of the things they did was to begin to change our name in the public sector to Negroes and others. That was not us making that change, that's others. So Frederick Douglass stood on his ground. He knew who he was as an African man. He knew that his people needed to be free. He broke free himself and spent his entire life until he died at about 78, fighting for the freedom of his people. He saw education as being a primary tool in that fight and the knowing of history as also being a major tool in that fight and owning America. Don't let America escape the ownership by African-Americans. We fought in every war in this nation. We fought to build the economy and the wealth of this nation. Let nobody try to make you feel marginalized for being here. We are probably the only person that shouldn't feel marginalized for being in North America. And for our Native, I don't want to say Native American because Africans was here before the Asiatic Mongolian population that we call Indians came. We amalgamated with that population. That's why they went from yellow and black to red. But that's another story, <laughs> another history we need to get onto. But the key thing is Fred Douglas epitomized what the frontiers are doing today, giving service to the black community, standing up for those who were oppressed. And he didn't just stand up for black people. He stood up for the white community vociferously. He stood up as the only black male in the, in the first meeting of the white women's movement convention and spoke on behalf of women in this country and stayed alive the day he died. Model of how to be a citizen and how to be a advocate for justice. I'm um, to meet you, Mr. Bliss, you're a cool brother. I'm going to be talking about you a heck of a lot more. Thank you so much, Professor Small. And to all of you for joining us on today, we so appreciate your presence and your engagement during this lecture. 
about the important history and the placement in history of Frederick Douglass, the legacy that he established so long ago still resonates with us today and ought to be demonstrated in the work that we do and the service we provide to one another. As Professor Small said, avoid the acceptance of marginalization and take your place in society as a leader, a thought leader, and a change agent. I am Safir Jenkins, president of these, your Frontiers International Plainfield Area Club. It gives me great pleasure to again thank you, and I wish you love, peace, and joy. Have a great day.